Okay. And now I would like to introduce two of the members of um, the Fixer Advisory Group. Fixer Advisory Group has been around for three years. They are a full service consultancy and trusted partner and advisor to many executive founders and investors in the luxury retail and consumer industries. And first I'd like to introduce Brooke Bullen. Brooke, just wave. So Brooke <laughs> has over 15 years of combined experience in law, fashion, tech, sports, venture capitalists, and corporate finance. And now she is at the Fixer Advisory Group. Prior to that, Brooke was the VP Creative Counsel at Create Me, which was one of the fastest growing apparel tech startups. Um, she also worked at a, a special place called Gucci, and she was VP General Counsel there. She also began her legal career at Herrick, where she practiced corporate and sports law. And she represented a lot of sports teams and public and private companies, startups, venture capitals, and private equity. Um, prior to doing that, she also worked in PR in the advertising industry. And she received her um, JD from Brooklyn Law School, where she was the editor in chief. And she was also um, all, uh, and uh, sorry, editor in chief of the Journal of Law and Policy. Hmm. Um, and her BS in communications from NYU, uh, where she was an all university honor scholar. So. I mean, she hasn't done a whole lot, but pretty impressive. <laughs> so thank you, Brooke. Thank and you, along with Brooke is Natalie Newman. Natalie, there we go. Thank you, Natalie. And Natalie has over 19 years of diverse experience in fashion, retail, digital technology, and corporate sectors. And she, um, prior to joining Fixer Advisory Group, she was the divisional vice president, deputy general counsel at Free Holdings, um, the global fashion luxury group. Um, and during her 12 years at Capri, she really supported the company through the growth access um, across all the product categories, the geographies, the retail footprints and distribution. Um, she was also a key member of the Capri executive team and um, led the development and implementation of the many of the company's many foundational data privacy and security compliance programs. Ooh, say that 10 times fast. Um, she also uh, was the, in November, 2023, Along with her colleagues, she was honored to receive the Law Department of the Year Award at the Law at the Luxury Law Summit Americas, and um, she began her legal career at Brown, Raisman, Milstein, Felder, and Steiner LLP. Um, and we are excited to have both of these ladies today. And I'm going to turn it over to Brooke and Natalie. Now, if you have questions along the way, you can put them in the chat or you can put them, or you can just reach out to me. I think the chat is open, so everybody should be able to put your information in the chat if you do have a question or you can raise your hand, um, but we'll, let, we'll go ahead and let Brooke and Natalie get started. Thank you so much, Cindy, and also Karen for this opportunity. It's really terrific to be here. Um, we at Fixer recently became associate member of the Accessories Council, which is a really exciting moment for us, um, not only because it allows us to learn about um, additional brands that, that you know, may be in need of our help, but also just to stay in the mix of what's going on in the industry and hopefully be able to support members through content um, like we're offering today. 
So thank you again for that very warm welcome, um, really taking us down memory lane of our, our careers. But most importantly, we're here today, we're with Fixer and, and excited to see some familiar faces on this webinar, as well as some new faces that, that we're really um, excited to meet. So just briefly, as Cindy mentioned, we are at Fixer, a full service consultancy. We work with executives, founders, and investors, uh, as well as their teams in all areas of luxury, retail, and consumer industries, uh, with a particular emphasis on fashion, accessories, uh, and related retail. And our particular areas of specialty include legal and compliance, which we'll be talking about today, as well as a host of other areas, such as human resources, corporate culture, real estate, sustainability, strategy, et cetera, and so on. Um, and on the screen, I'm really pleased to share some of the incredible clients that we work with. Um, these are just a few examples, but we um, love to tout the brands that we work with because um, they're just incredible brands. Some of them are actually also members of the Accessories Council, uh, and I'm sure you've heard of them. So with that, I'll turn it over to Natalie. Brooke, um, and thank you, Cindy and Karen, for, for having us. We, as Brooke said, we are so excited to be here. Um, I am so happy to be here today to have the opportunity to talk to you guys all about this important topic. Um, so our goal today is to equip you with some essential knowledge about intellectual property or IP, which is how we'll refer to it throughout the presentation, um, which should hopefully empower many of you to protect your unique creations to the extent you haven't done so already, um, and ultimately leverage those unique, wonderful creations for commercial success. Uh, so we've structured the session today to include some key definitions. Um, we'll go through some important case studies, um, some real life examples, um, and then talk through some actionable strategies for you all to explore. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, we'll wrap up with a Q&A session and we really encourage you guys to ask us anything and everything. Um, you know, we're, we're here to educate and, and also to learn from you guys. So very excited. So diving right in, what is intellectual property? Um, in simple terms, intellectual property or IP refers to the creations that originate from your mind. Um, this includes designs, logos, branding, even unique processes. IP rights are especially crucial for businesses in the accessories industry, in many industries, but particular, you know, fashion and accessories. I mean, it allows you pro to protect your originality um, in your works in what continues to be a very crowded and growing marketplace. Absolutely. There are, as you can see on the screen, several types of IP that are particularly relevant to the industries we serve and the Accessories Council serves. Um, first, trademarks distinguish your brand in the marketplace by covering brand names, logos, and slogans. Um, we like to use the Nike example because they cover all the bases. The brand name is Nike, the iconic swoosh logo, and the Just Do It slogan. Those are all trademarks, even though they're used in slightly different ways. Um, we'll also share a trademark secret. You have probably seen the um, TM symbol and the R in a circle, which you could see here on the screen. Both indicate that something functions as a trademark, but you can only use the R in the circle if your trademark is actually registered with the US Patent and Trademark Office, which we'll talk a lot about um, more on that later. But that's a little tip for you to know whether someone is claiming a trademark using TM or has actually registered it, which is an important distinction. Very much so. Um, so next on this bullet list um, of IP rights is copyrights. So copyrights protect artistic works. This could be a beautiful fabric pattern, a unique jewelry design, um, a photograph that of that apparel or jewelry, or even an innovative advertising campaign. Um, importantly, copyright protection actually arises automatically at the time of and upon creation. So it's actually not necessary to register your copyrights in order to have those rights, similar to what Brooke was explaining. However, and we'll get into this in a little more detail later, registering your copyrights can help enhance enforcement capabilities and uh, could even help to enhance potential damages against infringers should 
you decide to go after an infringer if you have one of those claims. Yes. Um, rounding out other areas of intellectual property, we also have design patents, which specifically guard the design and ornamental aspects of your products. So for example, if someone replicates your unique handbag shape or uh, shoe shape, you might have legal avenues through design patents to protect that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then lastly, trade secrets could be anything from your exclusive material sourcing to a unique process that you use in your manufacturing. And effective management of trade secrets is really pivotal, pivotal in keeping a competitive advantage. And we'll talk more about how you do that as well. Yeah, and I, I'm excited to talk to you guys about trade secrets and uh, and design patents, also about trademarks and copyrights. But I, I find that typically um, legal presentations about IP tend to limit to trademarks and copyrights, which are extremely important um, and, and critical to for brands and companies to understand. But there can be some value in design patents and, and trade secrets. Every company has them. And so I, I'm happy that we're, we're including that for you guys today. And as Brooke said, we're going to get into that in more detail later. So now that we have a basic understanding of what sort of the main tenets of um, intellectual property rights are, let's discuss why it matters for brands. Um, intellectual property is foundational for expanding brand recognition. It helps to distinguish identity. Um, it helps to establish reputation that consumers can recognize and trust in a brand. Uh, as I mentioned before, and as everyone on this call is all too familiar, the accessories space and the fashion space, it's very crowded, it's, it's very busy, and distinguishing one brand from another is critical. Um, so, you know, all intellectual property, particularly trademarks, can really help a brand do that. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you think about your favorite brand, which might be your own brand, if you're on this webinar, and how you can effortless, effortlessly identify it among a sea of competitors. Um, you know, iconic symbols come to mind, colors might come to mind. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. And this distinctiveness is obviously critical for consumers. You want them to, to recognize you immediately, um, but it's also essential for, for market differentiation and enhancing competitiveness um, among different brands and really helping your brand or the brands you support stand out. Strong IP and a strong IP portfolio, in particular trademarks, uh, can also open doors for brands to lucrative revenue streams, in, in particular through licensing deals. So this diversity of revenue really helps to sustain growth for brands. So a real life example, as Cindy mentioned in her intro to me, prior to joining Fixer as general counsel, I had a long career in-house um, in the legal department at Capri Holdings Limited, which own the, owns the brands Michael Kors, Versace, and Jimmy Choo. Um, and so uh, nothing I'm telling you here today is um, confidential, um, but I find it super interesting. So an example of a, a licensing deal, um, Michael Kors license has always licensed and continues to license its trademarks and other IP to Fossil, who manufactures and distributes watches and jewelry for Michael Kors using the Michael Kors name, marks, and IP. Again, this is not a secret or confidential. Um, in fact, if you're a customer of a Michael Kors watch and, and you, you know, have a have an issue, as the manufacturer and distributor Fossil often handles the customer service um, issues with respect to that. So, um, and, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this example is, so back around 2010, so 14 years ago, um, it was really Michael Kors watches that became extremely popular. Um, and because of that, were one of the main things that really launched the company into its booming success right before its IPO in 2011. Um, and the importance of that is, you know, the, the company and the brand started out as an apparel and accessories brand. It did not have the expertise um, 
to manufacture and distribute watches and jewelry. And so many brands who do want to expand into other categories or even other geographic markets, they partner with, um, you know, whether it's a local partner or a specialized partner who can help, who, who know what they're doing in that industry or market and, and can help a brand grow. Um, and the critical piece of that, however, is the brand having a strong IP portfolio um, and being able to license the rights um, to, to, the, to the licensee to use the trademarks, the marks, the name, the look and feel um, to create these other products or to bring the brand into um, another jurisdiction. So in addition to really having commercial benefit for a brand, uh, I hope that that example was helpful. Um, to extrapolate that, but IP rights, you know, when maintained and used appropriately, they can also help to prevent costly infringements and fraud. Um, copycats are a huge issue for many brands, for some brands, not as much, um, but they are a big issue out there and solid IP strategy can mean that your brand can be better positioned to be better protected from counterfeit, counterfeiting and from copying. Um, and that if you don't get a hold on counterfeiting and copying, if it is a problem for your brand or becomes a problem for your brand, it, it really can impact sales and brand reputation. All that goodwill you've built um, up through your name and your trademarks, um, you know, can, can potentially be damaged when a consumer buys a counterfeit or fake product. Um, they're often dissatisfied due to quality issues. Uh, and it could negatively and often does negatively impact the original brand. So IP rights for many reasons are essential to stopping counterfeiting and ultimately hopefully, hopefully stamping it out. Yeah, and on a similar note, I think we see so much in not only the accessories industry, but also beyond um, consumers really are demanding authenticity more now than ever. Um, and protecting IP really helps to build brand loyalty among consumers. When they invest in authentic products, they feel confident that they're getting quality and creativity behind each purchase. Um, you know, you can see this when you might uh, have an authentic product and you see, as Natalie was saying, fakes in the market that really kind of devalue the authentic product that you have. Um, similarly with the quiet luxury movement that that we've been seeing, you know, over the last year or so, the the quality of the product, the authenticity of the product is really what's selling it even um, more so lately than some of the more in your face logos and identifiable trademarks. Um, and IP applies to all of these different products. It doesn't have to have uh, a particularly noteworthy logo or trademark or even copyrighted print. There can be other elements of a brand that can be protected, even if the designs are more simplistic. Yeah, very true. So trademarks, um, let's dive deeper into the importance of trademarks and some important trademark law concepts. So a trademark isn't just a logo or a name. It's an essential tool for establishing the identity of your brand in a crowded market. And I know we've said that many times over already in this presentation, but it really is important um, as it indicates the source of goods. It allows consumers to distinguish your products from others and those of your competitors. And again, this helps to build brand recognition um, and fosters loyalty. So it, many, many important aspects of, of trademarks. So how do you get a trademark? Um, that's often the burning question. I'm sure some of you on this call may have a trademark portfolio. Some of you might just be starting out or advising other brands on starting out. Um, so there are several key steps to ensure that your brand is well protected. Um, trademark registration is easy in the sense that there's an online system, you can log on, submit your trademark, but navigating the trademark registration process is actually more complex than that. There's steps that have to be followed to make sure that you actually get a successful registration. And the first step to that is conducting a preliminary search. 
Before you even file an application, it's really critical to check for existing trademarks that might be similar to yours or that could potentially cause confusion. And there's many different ways to search. Um, certainly you wanna search relative to the products that you're offering, whether it's jewelry, cosmetics, handbags, shoes, but also maybe in related categories like wellness, hospitality, um, other types of, of um, industries where confusion could arise as to where a product is emanating from. So how do you do that? I'll turn that over to Natalie to explain. Yeah, so as Brooke was alluding to, determining which classes to register your marks in and when to register those marks in those classes is all and should all be part of a brand's overall trademark strategy. So what is a class? Um, there is an internationally recognized list of, I believe it is 45 different trademark classes. Um, and these classify goods and services into broad categories. So some relevant examples, class 18 broadly covers leather goods, class 14 covers jewelry, class 25 covers clothing. So as, as Brooke mentioned, there are some services categories too. There's a, a, a service category that would cover if you open a retail store, you wanna do business and commerce, there's a category um, that covers that. And as I mentioned, there are 45, um, which may seem like a lot, but when you think about it, um, maybe isn't a lot because there are, there are so many subcategories and types of products and services. And so you really do have to have um, a strategy because you wanna cover your bases. Um, and as Brooke mentioned, it's it's easy-ish to search, um, to, to at least conduct an additional, uh, an initial search to see what other um, names and similar trademarks are out there. So there is a publicly accessible system called the called TESS, um, trademark, trademark Electronic Search System. It's a database provided by the US Patent and Trademark Office. Um, it's publicly accessible, anyone can go on there. Um, and as Brooke mentioned, when you're typing in your name, you know, your trademark, you should not only consider exact matches that pop up, but sort of similar names or variations um, that could cause confusion or be confused with the trademark that you're trying to register. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of intricacies to this, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later, because like I said, you could do it on your own, but it actually helps when you're working with a specialist and, and we'll explain why. Once you've conducted your search and you've confirmed that your trademark is unique, it hasn't been registered by someone else, then your next step, of course, is going to be to file your application. Um, and to do that, you'll need certain specific details, obviously, including your name, your company name, if you're registering it through a company, whether you have IP counsel, the trademark itself, whether it's a word, whether it's um, some type of stylized design and the goods and services that it will be associated with. And you'll also have to choose the filing basis, whether you're registering based on the fact that you're using it today in commerce, you're selling a product, or you're offering a service, or you have a what's called a bona fide intention to use the mark at some point in the future. And that amount of time is, is set under the law when you actually have to start using it in order to go ahead and file a trademark. Um, and as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there are guardrails around this process because based on what we're saying, it would be easy to just try to file for everything, protect in every class, protect every possible iteration of the name and every good and service. It doesn't actually work like that because you do have to show that you're using it and you have to do that over time. So we'll talk about that in a second. I, I find the whole registration process interesting and exciting. I find the after the application process to be even more interesting and and, and intriguing. Um, so after filing, um, an actual examiner at the trademark office will examine your application and they it, it is an actual human examining it and it can take up to several months um, or even more. Um, and as Brooke mentioned, they check for conflicts with existing trademarks all to ensure that the trademark complies with legal standards and they're not uh, allowing a trademark to go through that will somehow conflict with another one that's already registered. 
Um, so if your application meets all of the necessary criteria, you'll receive what's called a notice of allowance if you filed on the basis of an intent to use. And what that is, um, is it's sort of a, a basically a, a, a notice of pending registration. You're allowed to go and, and use it in the market and in commerce, um, but you have to, because it's an intent to use as opposed to we're actually currently using this in commerce, um, you do have to supply the trademark office with evidence and specimens of use, whether that's a screenshot of how you're using it on a product being sold online um, or uh, a copy of a hang tag that has your mark. Um, so you, ha you have to provide the trademark office with this evidence. Um, and if you've filed your application on the basis of actual use, then, and the trademark office clears your application, you'll get a registration certificate. And if any of you on watching today have dealt with this process, there's so many variables that can come up in that portion of the process when it's being examined. Um, and also even at, even just after you file the application, because we'll talk about this a little bit later as it relates to even protecting your own brand, all of this information is publicly available. And so brands can essentially monitor the USPTO um, register to see what trademark applications are coming in. And savvy brands will do that on a regular consistent basis to see if there are any trademark applications that are too close to theirs, or might be confusing or might you know sound like their brand name. And so any number of things can happen. You can have the PTO examiner raise objections because maybe your proposed trademark doesn't fit the legal criteria for being a trademark. You could have another brand approach you because they found out that you're pursuing this process. So there's a lot of complicating factors. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how you deal with that and, and also how you partner with experts that can really help you through the process. And as I mentioned before, there are ongoing responsibilities to this. If you've ever applied for a trademark, when you get your first trademark registration, it's so exciting. When we got, uh, we've been doing this for literally decades. And we, when we got our trademark registration for Fixer, we were so excited because it really means something in the world when you have that trademark behind you. Um, but it doesn't end there. Really, that's kind of where the party's just starting. Um, you have to maintain your trademark. You have to continue to use it. You have to continue showing the USPTO that you are using it in the right way. And you also have to monitor the market to make sure that other people aren't using it. Because if you don't, you could be subject to and vulnerable to third parties seeking to cancel your registration, saying, They've registered for this, they've cornered the market on this name, but they're not actually using it. Why can't I use it? And that's a real thing. So again, this is a constant process of monitoring your IP, particularly when it comes to trademarks. Yeah, cancel, you know, other companies attempting to cancel your registration or when your registration, your application is pending registration, there's um, often a period of opposition um, and it, that is an opportunity for other brands to submit opposition or arguments of why your trademark, um, you know, shouldn't be shouldn't be registered. So, as you can tell, it's a very complex process, um, especially if there are any complicating factors that come up during your search. It's not really a clear cut situation when you get the search results. So, of course, we I mean we always recommend partnering with experienced IP counsel and shameless plug fixer. <laughs> we could, you know, we we help as Brooke showed at the beginning of this. Um, we partner with many of our clients um, who are big and small brands alike to help them navigate this process. And um, you know, as Brooke shared of the excitement of Fixer itself when when we got our trademark, I mean it's it's really a critical business asset to maybe one of the most critical business assets to a, a brand, especially in the accessories space. Um, so it's important that, you, you know, you get this right and you, and you do it right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and investing time and resources into proper trademark registration, making sure you're doing it the right way will not only safeguard your brand and provide peace of mind, as you continue to grow in the market, but it can save you a lot of money and headaches as well. 
And being proactive just ensures that your unique identity is protected as you start to grow in the market and potentially grow internationally, which we're going to talk about as well. I want to be mindful of time. Let's quickly go through copyright essentials. Yes. Um, so copy. So we talked about trademark and now we'll talk about copyrights. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, copyrights cover original artistic works, um, which not only include fashion and accessories designs, but can also include marketing content, product descriptions, you know, the written product descriptions, even website designs or software codes, since software code is a form of written expression. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to repeat, copyright protection occurs automatically upon the creation of a work in a tangible medium of expression. So this means as soon as you draft an original design, you snap a photograph, or you write an original marketing piece, it's protected by copyright. And interestingly, copyright is not indefinite, but it's pretty long. So copyright protection under the law that Natalie was mentioning lasts for the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years. So it gives long-term value, but it's not forever. Um, some of you might have heard in the last few months that Mickey Mouse copyright actually ran out. Um, it was for presumably the life of Walt Disney, uh, plus 70 years. And now it's essentially what's called in the public domain, um, which means that any number of different creators can take Mickey and start using it in different ways. And of course, um, that resulted in many funny and probably not so funny uses of Mickey, uh, but it, it does go to show that um, the protection lasts, lasts a long time, but it's not forever. Um, and, and thinking of that, how it's the life of the creator plus 70 years, it's important to point out that copyright protection, it, since it arises at the point of creation, it arises with the creator of that work. So an important question for brands and for businesses is what, what happens when an employee of your brand creates something? Who owns the copyright in that work? Uh, so under U.S. copyright law, and it's a little bit different outside the U.S., but under U.S. copyright law, the general rule is that an, if, an, if an employee creates a work in the scope of their employment, the copyright is owned by the employer. And this is known as the work for hire, work made for hire doctrine in the U.S., and this is really critical to understand because that means if your designer, for example, creates a unique jewelry design as part of their job function, your company would automatically own the copyright for that design. This is another reason why, and we could do a whole separate session on this, why it's really important to have an entity for your brand as opposed to doing it individually, maybe partnering um, you know, with, with others in sort of an, an informal way. Um, and so what we advise to avoid any ambiguity, even in the employment context, when you do have an entity set up, is to have clear employment contracts and documents that explicitly state that any works created in the scope of employment belong to the company. Um, and, and this is great for small companies and big companies alike, uh, <clears throat> but many smaller companies and big companies also, but smaller companies maybe don't have a big um, in-house design team um, and do partner with, whether it's a freelance designer or an independent contractor, you know, independent designer to help create the work or create a part of the work. Um, so the situation changes slightly when that individual is not an employee, they're a, a third party um, engaged by the company, but not employed by the company. And in those cases, the company typically doesn't own the copyright unless there's a written agreement in place that expressly states that any creations or work product are a work for hire. And then that contract or the agreement would um, have an assignment from the creator, from the freelancer to the company of all the IP rights that arose in that creation and in the work. Um, and it's really critical for companies to understand this concept because failing to secure ownership at the beginning before a work is created uh, can really lead to disputes over creative works down the line. I've seen it happen um, in my career time and time again. So it, it's it's critical to get your paperwork in place. Yeah, having robust agreements really helps prevent misunderstandings and potential legal conflicts because 
as so many of us know in the creative industry, creativity is a beautiful thing and creations, you know, can occur even when you're not expecting it. Maybe you're riffing on something and, and you don't want down the line to have to be getting into a legal dispute about who owns something relative to your brand. Um, and so we really feel like having the right agreements in place is one of the most essential and foundational elements especially for earlier stage brands, but really brands at all stages. And we assist our clients with these all the time. Yeah. And since copyright protection, it's again, automatic upon creation. Um, you actually don't have to register your copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office in order to secure the rights to that. Um, however, registration is very beneficial and it, it, and it only makes it easier to enforce your rights against infringers. It can act as a, a deterrent against potential infringers. And um, if there is a, a real case of infringement or copying, um, it having a registered, having registered copyrights in a work can allow for a brand or an owner to get increased statutory damages and attorney's fees if you have to take legal action. And that's a big deal for a lot of brands. All right, let's move to design patents, which I know Natalie's really excited to talk okay, about. Today. Just give you a time check because we're at almost at 12.45 already. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. I am excited to talk about design patents um, just because I think it's a, an interesting and maybe lesser known area of, of IP law. Uh, so it, it is just like trademarks and copyrights, it's a key form of IP protection in the fashion industry. And what a design patent does, it, it, it protects the ornamental design of a functional item. So it's not about how the item works or the functionality of the item. It's about how it looks, the shape, the configuration, surface ornamentation, overall aesthetic appeal of a product. So it's different than another type of patent, which is really focused on the function. Yeah. So if you create a unique handbag, for example, with a distinctive shape or a unique surface detail, you can file for a design patent to prevent others from copying that specific aspect of your design. But as Natalie mentioned, it doesn't protect the functional aspects of the product or its use. It really focuses on the visual qualities. So here you can see um, what would have been submitted by Longchamp, actually, for one of their design patents on their distinctive uh, handbag visual design. Um, and so the duration of protection for a design patent is actually 15 years from the date it's granted. So that could that can provide a company with enough time to capitalize on your design without worry of imitation from competitors. And really one of the biggest advantages for filing a design patent, um, I mean, there's, there's many advantages, but trademark, everyone thinks of trademark as, as sort of one of the main areas of protection as well as copyright. But trademark doesn't necessarily protect a design like this. For example, um, the Longchamp design, there might be elements within that handbag that could be subject to trademark protection, but as a whole, it's not. And so that's where design patents come in. And if you have the design patent in hand, you then have a legal tool to exclude others from using that same design, importing that same design, maybe from counterfeits in other territories. Um, you can enforce this against multiple channels that might be infringing upon your design. Um, and then as Natalie was mentioning with the Michael Kors example, design patents also give you additional leverage for licensing agreements because you can utilize your unique designs in order to um, create some interesting collaborations and licensing opportunities for additional revenue stream. So design patents can be great. They really can be a great asset, um, but I, don't want to mislead anyone in thinking that this is an easy an easy thing to obtain. Obtaining a design patent does require um, an investment of time and resources. You have to file a detailed application with the USPTO, uh, the Patent and Trademark Office, and it includes detailed drawings and photographs of your design along with a detailed and specific written description. Um, you also have really should conduct what's called a prior art search um, to ensure that your design is sufficiently unique before filing. Because again, the the design patent it's for it's for you know unique ornamentality. Uh, 
of something. So in order to be unique, there can't be something that exists prior um, that's sufficiently similar or substantially similar to that. So this can, I mean, you you have to work with an expert to do this, and this can be pretty substantial investment and time and effort. Um, and again, it, it's a great tool, but maybe not necessarily the most practical one, especially if um, it's a, a brand just starting out, um, you know, and allocating, you know, certain budget for certain things. Um, this may not be um, the best use, but but it can be very powerful. Okay, let's move to a really iconic case uh, in the IP world in fashion. Yeah, so this is, um, we'll very briefly go through this, but as you can see on the screen, these are the Christian Louboutin red soled shoes. Um, and this is one of the well, most well-known um, trademark battles in, in fashion IP. And Louboutin has been involved in actually many lawsuits and legal disputes over the years, including currently um, with many different companies, um, starting most famously with its lawsuit against Yves Saint Laurent in 2012. Um, and all of this is in an effort by Christian Louboutin to defend its trademark rights and the iconic red soles of their high-heeled shoes and, and other shoes. Um, and the legal basis for that is the distinctive color, right, of this red and, and the use of that distinctive color has become essentially synonymous with the Louboutin brand. Um, and Louboutin has had many important successes over the years with this, but still continues to vigorously defend itself and protect its rights um, and going after companies for new cases of infringement. Yeah, and the Louboutin cases are, are really significant in the IP world because it was really the landmark case to showcase that color can be trademarked when it serves to identify a brand. Um, if you think about the Tiffany um, signature turquoise blue color, Hermes orange. Um, and so that just provided another avenue for brands to protect their identity, not just through words, not just through logos, um, you know, or, or even illustrations, but also something as, um, you know, simple as color. So, hey, and Natalie, I have a quick question on the design patent. So the design patent is for 15 years. Yes. So when you're getting close to the end of your 15 years, can you reapply to, or it doesn't, it's done? Rob, do you want to take that one? I think it's, it, it's done. It opens it up very much like in a, in a regular patent. Yeah, essentially the the um, design patent law is a little bit different from the regular patent law relative to like other types of functionalities and formulas and things in the sense that it was created and, and this is all subject to legislation and so it could change over time, but it was really created to allow brands to have a sufficient amount of time to really capitalize on their designs, to create something unique, market it, and then over time, develop other ways to protect it beyond just the design patent. One thing we haven't really talked about a lot today and could be part of a follow-up session is trade dress. That's um, another type of IP protection, which tends to kick in um, where it's a little bit amorphous. It might not be trademark, it might not be copyright, but the overall like visual appearance of something, you know, that's Longchamp, that's, you know, whoever it might be. Um, and so design patent is really to provide kind of an incubator period for the brand to utilize that design, to capitalize on it to the maximum extent possible, and then seek other ways to protect it. So that once that 15 years passes, other people are using other types of designs, um, but it's not a total monopoly on a particular visual element um, without other types of protection in place. Thank you. So, we can quickly talk about trade secrets and brand strategy. Yes, so very quickly, um, mindful of time. Um, so trade secrets, so this comprises practices, designs, formulas, processes, and other valuable information not generally known to the public. So this is critical in the fashion industry and the accessories industry, particularly, particularly with, for example, unique manufacturing techniques or other proprietary practice. This is really the secret sauce of a company. 
Absolutely. And so many things can fall into um, what constitutes a trade secret. It could be a proprietary formula for how you uh, do a leather finish. Um, it could be the exact specifications on how you construct a particular shoe or a uh, piece of jewelry. So um, really anything that is proprietary and distinctive to you can be protected. And trade secret protection arises with and is maintained with confidentiality, security, and limiting access to that proprietary information or materials. It, the value of a trade secret is that it's a secret. Um, so one of the most essential ways to foster this security is to implement NDAs or non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements with both employees and third-party partners alike. Um, and in addition to NDAs, you know, having internal policies to to um, limit access to certain sensitive information. Not everybody in the company needs access to, you know, the most sensitive uh, keys to the kingdom, for example. Yeah, and the really interesting aspect about trademark uh, trade secrets, as opposed to um, like patents, which are also have very proprietary elements to them. Um, you know, the patent for a particular formula is incredibly valuable to a company, but trade secrets can be kept confidential, whereas patents have to be publicly disclosed. And so that's another strategic element to think about um, when you have something that's really unique to your business. Um, Cindy, I think we have a few more slides, but I think this could be a natural place for us to stop this session and see if there's some questions before we hit the top of the hour. That is perfect. All right. So um, if you have any questions, I mean, my head is just spinning a little. I'll be honest. <laughs> You know, <laughs> when you start thinking about some of these design patents and all these things. So if you have a question, please feel free um, to go ahead and ask Brooke um, or and and um, and Natalie right now before it's 12.55. So we have five minutes. The other thing I should note, um, and we're happy to take any questions on today's session, is we'd love to do more sessions uh, just like this one with the Accessories Council. It could be on IP. It could be on other legal topics, um, HR, any of the other industries I mentioned before. So we'd also love to hear from you for uh, with regard to other topics of interest that uh, might form a future session. Yeah, things that are super relevant to you guys right now. You know, we can tailor presentations and discussions for that, for sure. I thought the session was extraordinary. I learned a lot, um, so Thank valuable. You. Thank you very much. Um, so really I cool. actually did have one question. Uh, <laughs> in regards to trademarks and um, I know that sometimes it takes a long time to get your trademark for a brand name. And how long should you actually say at some point, okay, I don't think I'm going to get it. It really depends on the circumstances of your application. Sometimes it takes a long time because there's a backup in the USPTO um, and you know, we like to advise clients on what the intel is at the moment as to how long they should expect to wait to hear from the examiner. Um, because that's really the initial examination is the longest part. It's when they get around to it. If they have no issues with your application and they just move it forward from there, it's a lot more formulaic because it goes through a process and there are a certain number of days that accompany each part of that process. However, if it takes them a long time to get around to it, and then there's some issue that they identify, um, maybe they want you to change the description of your trademark. Maybe they have a question about the specimen that you've provided, any number of issues. Then you get into this back and forth. And the Patent and Trademark Office gives you time to respond, but then the longer time you take to respond, then they have to look at it for another 30 or 60 days, and it can get really frustrating. And they don't really respond that well to nudging in the traditional sense. You're a little bit at their mercy. So like I said, every situation is unique, but we really try to work with clients to get the application right from the beginning so that you can hopefully minimize anything that's in your control. 
if they're just really backed up, there's not so much you could do. But if there's ways to really put forth the best, tightest application, that's value that we like to bring to clients to say, we feel like this is a great chance of flying right through the process. And hopefully that's the case. All right. Well, thank you so much today. And if anybody does have, maybe you were afraid to ask a question or you weren't sure, or you would like to learn some other topics, please feel free to reach out to me. And um, we would love to have the Fixer Advisory ladies come back and um, do another webinar when they can. They have a lot of different topics, including HR, which I thought was also very interesting. So um, please feel free. And I know we had quite a few new people. Um, we'd love to talk to you about the Accessories Council as well. And one last thing, don't forget to vote for your Design Excellence Awards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Thank Bye you, everybody. and everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.